a little bit about where my novels come from and how I got the idea for the latest novel, The Bones of Paradise, which is set in the Nebraska Sand Hills and on the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation. And it's set in 1890 and 1900, so it's the back part has to do with Wounded Knee and the Wounded Knee Massacre, and the front part has to do with the fallout of all of that, on both the white and the native American families that are involved. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, and you know, I have I've published six novels, I have editors and agents in New York, um, and one of the questions they asked me to think about was why would I write about the West? What does a woman have to say about the West? Now that's New York. <laughs> they, they, don't, they, I don't know where they think the West is. In California. <laughs> but, so it made me think, though, and I thought, well, of course I have a right to write about the West. Why not? But I, I they did answer. I tried to answer the question. So I thought I'd uh, tell you a little bit. I'll just read you this little thing I wrote about why I write about the West. And first of all, I have to come out and admit it. I'm really, I don't look like it right now, but I'm a cowgirl at heart. Um, I grew up in rural Nebraska, outside Omaha, in a large family, and each summer the kids were given the choice of getting a pair of sneakers or a pair of sandals for shoes. And I always chose cowboy boots. And uh, those were inconvenient, yes. Especially running to keep up with the older kids, or chase the golden retriever who kept escaping her pen or make my own escape from it. We had this vicious black rooster who would hurl itself after us and chase us all over the orchard. And he was really scary. And I used to say the 23rd poem, uh, song sorry, to escape him. And, but I did my own version because I was a little kid and I didn't know what the words meant, so I kind of changed some of them around. <laughs> As I'm sure you've all done too, until you wrote and figured it out. Um, every birthday and Christmas I ask for a horse. You know, is anyone here a horse person? People have loved them. Yeah, aren't they great? They're the best. Now, did you raise your hand because that's one of the 20 points here? Do you really love horses? No, I love horses. <laughs> yeah, they're good, aren't they? Good. Yeah, and of course, um, I instead, I, I, I got a toy gun. That was before guns were a problem. And a holster and a cowboy hat and a little um, red felt vest and skirt with little white fringe. And I had to ignore all the jokes from my siblings and my classmates because I did wear that to school. You can imagine. I befriended any person with a horse that would ride by my house and live in the country and let me climb up behind the saddle. And my legs would end up being pinched purple with bruises as we traveled along. But what I loved was I could close my eyes and see the landscape open up and roll empty before me into the west. And that was when the west began to move my imagination. Finally, my grandfather bought a farm outside Omaha. And um, after much begging on my part, he bought an old horse. Although he neglected to buy a bridle and saddle. <laughs> I did learn to ride bareback with a war bridle, which is you take a piece of clothesline, cotton clothesline, you put it through the horse's mouth, and then you have reins. Um, and when he finally relented and bought a saddle and bridle, they were the oldest, most cracked, worn out pieces of leather possible. I can only imagine, I think they were free. They were so dried and brittle. But they meant freedom and the, a way to climb on the horse without having to find something tall enough. More important, it meant I could hit the road. I don't know why my grandparents never worried when I packed a lunch and left of a morning, returning late afternoon, <laughs> making sure the horse wasn't sweating and blowing hard because a cowgirl always treated her horse better than herself. You see, I read nonstop too. I consumed every book about the West and horses in the Benson Public Library. I read a book a day. I couldn't stop. I also rode miles a day, finding worlds in the back of that old bay horse. I visited all the neighboring farms. Without any invitation, I would ride up their lanes and meet the women, mostly. There was a farm of Swedes close to my grandfather's, and they had two retired white work horses and the neatest barnyard for miles. I even took a ride on the too broad back of one of them, and realized I was how lucky I was to have the sturdy bay who would stand tied for hours without having to break away. And the wife was always kind to me, giving me a chocolate bar, a Hershey bar each visit. And that was before, you know, there were little corner stores everywhere. And so that was so amazing to get a chocolate bar. And I really liked her and appreciated her thoughtfulness, but she wasn't quite what I wanted. As I wandered further away, I found a dilapidated farm 
full of chickens roosting and squawking and fighting with the ducks and cats and dogs and goats and milk cows. The house was a riot of dirty dishes and clothes flung off and more animals and flies and stacks of newspapers and reigning over all of this was a couple. She became the first genuinely independent woman of the land I would meet. Irma was tall and broad, dressed always in a dingy white man's t-shirt and jeans, her braless breasts hanging like sacks of meal almost to her waist, her hair hanging so brownish gray rising over her brown sweaty face. There was no question that she ever wore makeup or cared to. She was as big as her husband and could toss bales of hay, drive a tractor, run a repair a manure spreader, and butcher a hog. I don't know who if anyone ever tended that house, but it didn't matter. She was a neutral in the division of labor. She didn't offer me one day of good deed. I doubt she ever thought of it. She inspected me and the horse that first time and gave me a chance to glance around because they were bailing hay that day. She had come. Whenever I write about the West, I think about Irma. I've seen her kind in the sand hills in Nebraska. Is anyone here from the sand hills? Well, you're kind of almost in the sand hills here. They're, they're right there. Uh, and for the West, too. Our Western history is full of women who work side by side with men without getting their due. It's taken time to recover their stories, and I believe it's my job to bring their lives back to their rightful place. Years ago, I was out in the hills with a young photographer who just bought an old panorama camera, each doing our own research. I was researching a novel, and he was doing photography. When we decided to go to the Sandoz Ranch to see Mari Sandoz's grave, she was an early Sand Hills writer who wrote about ranch life. Uh, while Willa Catherine, the early Nebraska pioneer, and <laughs> was famous, Mary Sandoz wrote of Native Americans and cattle on the Sand Hills, and it was her work I felt closest to. People always ask me, well, what about Willa Catherine? Didn't she influence you? Well, I grew up in Nebraska, so I had to read Willa Catherine. Do you, anybody else here have that experience? Did you grow up here and you had to read a Willa Catherine book? Mm -hmm. And I didn't really like it much. I had to confess, when I was 16 years old, I thought, let me sell this. Okay, I, I was much more interested in other forms of literature. And um, then I found Mara Sandoz, and I liked her a lot better. So, and I've since read all of Catherine. I learned to appreciate her, but I had to grow into her. Her grave is at the end of a single blacktop lane winding among the hills, which you know are utterly empty of houses, power lines, and even fences. Her sister Flora was still alive in those days, and for a time kept a wonderful apple orchard nearby as an agricultural experience. And I visited that grave site often then to pay my respects and gain courage from the empty hills and open endless sky. On this particular day, my young friend had climbed the windmill for a better shot of the rolling hills when an old red pickup truck came rattling over the hill and stopped next to me. Uh oh, I thought, now we're in it. It was Flora, Mari's sister, who leaned out the window and asked, What the Sam Hill we were doing? I explained about the grave, and she looked up at my young friend and hollered, like, She'd like to hire him. She couldn't get anyone out to climb around on her windmills anymore to reason to fix them. She was worried about fire, she said, hadn't been into town in a month with the dry heat, afraid of what would happen if she left. She finally couldn't stand it, had to go to the beauty parlor. When I looked at her hair, a wild gray and white nest. I'm 80, she declared, can't cut my own toenails anymore. <laughs> Got a girl at the beauty parlor does them for me. That's handy, I said, hoping she'd invite us to her ranch house. You know, she didn't. She just waved and told us to be careful and drove off. When I returned the next year, the apple orchard was a pile of twisted wood. The experiment was done. She was another woman of the West. In Valentine, Nebraska, in the heart of the Sand Hills ranch land, the young ranch couples come to town dressed almost identically in jeans and loafers and western shirts. They're changing the look of the West, too. Economics these days require that both men and women work as hard as the first family did, families did. My great-great-grandmother smoked a clay pipe and ran a farm in the Missouri over the Cozarks. I come from that hard, scrabble stock, and I write about women who know how to survive on the land. It never occurred to me that I couldn't do that, and that's what it means to write the best. Um, one of the questions I get asked a lot, and maybe you'll have some questions too, is about how I came to write about wounded me um, 
you know, what my experience was there. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit, just a few minutes of my encounter with the ghost shirt. And have you ever heard of a ghost shirt? Some of you have, some of you haven't. Well, this will explain it. Uh, it has to do with the massacre and with the belief that the Lakota people had at that time about their vulnerability and what would, why they were dancing these. It was a typical hot sun soaked day in August when I entered the cool shadows of the small Catholic church on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota 25 years ago. A Lakota woman in a long brown skirt and plain white shirt graciously asked if I would like her to show me around. And I followed her as she explained that the wall decorations and traditional Lakota colors and the paintings were all done by native artists. It was startling to see the beautiful renderings of familiar biblical images through local eyes, and strangely moving too. Then we went to a small museum where she paused in front of a series of drawers built into the wall. Have you heard of the massacre at Wolverine? She asked in a quiet voice. I nodded, unsure what was next. It took both of her hands to pull out the wide, shallow drawer, although it slid with a mere whisper. She stepped aside and let me stare at the contents. A frayed, homemade shirt painted the pale blue of the Dakota sky, decorated with figures of butterflies, birds, buffalo, and antelope, among all manner of animals. It took my breath. I had only read about these shirts. I'd never hoped to see one. Years later, a Native American friend told me the woman should not have displayed it for a white person because it was sick. I felt ashamed and grateful both. At that moment, though, I felt the power like a faint mist rising from that shirt with the frayed neck and hem, blue paint flaking in places, the red not the color of blood, the yellow and white as saturated as the day the maker drew the lost figures. It was a homely piece of clothing, yet as rare as a piece of the true cloth, cross for believers. I understood why it belonged in the church and why my guide was protected by it. I don't know why she chose to show it to me, but it was a gift that stayed with me over the years. You could say that the massacre at Wounded Knee that took place 128 years ago was because of a shirt like the one I saw, which somehow survived the slaughter of over 300 women, children, elderly, and a few young warriors. For over a year, Native peoples have been gathering on Pine Ridge Reservation, drawn by a new religious ceremony, the Ghost Dance. There was no violence, nothing but half-starved people desperate for hope, dancing, chanting, and playing drums, and non-stop worship to bring back their old world. The promise was that the buffalo would come down the red road, leading all the other animals to restore the earth and bring the vanquished people back their land, their lives. With the perspective of contemporary culture and distance, it is amazing that such worship would threaten the white settlers, government agents, and army. But it did. Despite being ordered to stop dancing, the people continued. Despite being hungry because the Indian agents denied their, them subsidies and they weren't allowed weapons or means to hunt the game that had already been driven off the reservation, they danced. They danced in the summer heat and into the winter cold of November and December, their feet in their necks. As the army gathered, hauling up their newest and biggest cannons and guns, the people added another promise for their return to prosperity. They made ghost shirts that would stop the bullets of the guns pointed at them by drawing on the power of their connection to the sacred animals, the earth and the sky. Nothing could stop the dance that would bring the old world back. It is a gift to possess such powerful belief, and the day I saw the ghost shirt, I felt a tiny surge of the hope it carried that made me believe it might be possible to experience that transformation of reality. For over 25 years, I've thought about the two realities presented the day, that day on Rosebud and all those years earlier on Pine Ridge at Wounded Knee Creek. A pragmatist would join the army and laugh at the notion of a shirt that could repel bullets and a dance that could bring back a nearly extinct animal that had been slaughtered to make room for white settlements. If these beliefs were so absurd, so patently ridiculous in the face of reality, why were the authorities so afraid? 
That's what the shirt says to me. Such a homely object, yet still powerful enough to bring down the wrath of an entire government. Is there a fear, a suspicion, or a hope that lurks in the backs of our minds that the official reality isn't as real as it claims to be? Humans, especially governments and armies, have a history of killing what they don't understand, what they fear. A painted blue cotton shirt waits in the cool dark of a drawer in a little church in South Dakota, holding the secret. Now I'm going to just, this is just for your, let's see, where is it? Yes. There were a number of different newspaper reactions to that time, to the, before the, the massacre, to the dancing, to what was going on. And then there were a number of very interesting and sometimes terrible reactions afterwards in newspapers. The Omaha papers were generally very supportive of the Native Americans, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. Um, however, the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer from Aberdeen, South Dakota, the editor called for, and not for the first time, the total extermination of the Indians. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. The author of that statement and editor is L. Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz of our iconic mm -hmm. books, which I can never look at again. <laughs> I didn't realize what he was up to. Okay, so I've written um, three books set in the Nebraska Sandhills. The Bones of Paradise is the latest. And one of the things that drew me to the Sandhills was the fact that um, my father, I had never been out there, grew up in Omaha in Missouri. And my father and brothers would go out to the Sand Hills to hunt. Is anyone hunted out there? You know about all the wild game? And, no? Okay. That's probably good. Maybe some game will survive. <laughs> you just want to be careful walking around out there in the fall because it's full of people shooting. Um, and so I went out there one day and was driving around. I had a dream where I saw these uh, three siblings having an argument. Their father had died, they were in a ranch house. It was the middle of the night, and one of the characters gets up, and the young guy gets up and leaves, and gets on his horse and rides off. Well, when I wrote, I didn't know what that meant, so I had to, I figured it was a Western that I was writing, I was going to write about the West. And when I began to write that book, I had no idea where it was, and so I was writing mostly, everybody was doing stuff at night, and my editor got back to me and my agent, and they said, the editor mainly was critical. She said, well, they have to, we have to see some of these characters in the daytime. And they need to wear underwear. We think they probably wore underwear. And we'd like them getting out of pickup trucks rather than off horses and wagons. So I had to write the whole novel, which I had written already, uh, as a contemporary novel, which I did. And that was set in the 1980s. And then the second book uh, I wrote was set in the 90s, and that's another Ranch family. And then this book is the prequel. It's the founder of the first family. And so you find out about the father and, and what he did and the kinds of things they were involved in and the crimes they committed. It's really a story. All of the stories are stories of children and parents and children seeking some kind of justice. And family, not only families seeking justice, but entire peoples seeking the kind of justice. Which I, I think we're all drawn to issues of justice. We want justice. One of the first things we tell children is there's no justice. There's no fairness. <coughs> what a great thing to tell kids. Yeah, it all, all, it's all going to be unfair. Good luck to you. <laughs> and it's kind of cruel really and terrible. And so then I teach them they can be unfair by saying that. I think. So I've always been interested in that because it's where I am. And so those are the things that drew me to the Nebraska books. Now my, my Missouri books, I decided early on as a writer, as a novelist. I started life as a poet, by the way, because it was short, quick, and you could do it easily. And I didn't think I had the patience to write fiction until I came back to the Midwest. And then, of course, that's what we have here, right? Patience and time. <laughs> and so I thought, uh, so, yeah, so I started writing that. And I thought, I'll write three novels set in each of the three places 
that I've been to, you know, spent most of my life in. So it's Nebraska, Missouri, and Iowa. And, but, you know, not in cities. I don't like to write about cities. I'm, I'm not a city person. You don't mind coming in on my platoon And uh, so I've, I've, I'm in the midst of writing my third Missouri book. The first one was uh, South of Resurrection. And that's again about siblings and a crime that gets committed and someone having, I've always been interested in that issue of can you run away from problems? Can people leave home? You know, when I grew up in Omaha, they kept saying, get out of Nebraska. Go on. Go, go somewhere else. Make your mark somewhere else. And I don't know that we, do we still encourage people to leave Nebraska? I think we were surprised when everybody took them at their word and we all left. <laughs> they must have thought, what the heck is this? Why do all the young people leave? Well, you told us to leave. You said, go make your mark someplace. So we all did. Uh, but I've been interested in, uh, in writing about and thinking about what we leave behind and that whole thing of can you go home again? And what happens if you go home again? So in my Missouri books, I'm kind of exploring characters who go home and what happens because of that. Uh, my own parents spent their early life in Missouri and, and they had quite an interesting life, we found out after they passed, because they were secretly married at something like 15 or 16. They came to Nebraska to do that right away. And then no one knew about it. We, didn't, we couldn't figure out why they never had a wedding anniversary. And there were no, <laughs> no descriptions of their wedding. But somebody must have found out eventually because they had six kids. So that would have been evident something was going on. <laughs> That's what I thought. So uh, anyway, but my father would never step foot in the home, the, the small town in Missouri that they grew up in. And it was a very interesting place. And a lot of injustice goes on there. There's a lot of problems. We know Missouri has kind of become the poster child for everything horrible that's going on now. And it continues. So I am interested in finding out what happens when you go home to the <coughs> Having that father who would never go home, even after his mother was buried down there. And all of our relatives are down there. We still would not step foot in the place again. Um, so I kind of been prying secrets out of places and finding out. Yes, we're from Missouri. Oh, good. Where are you from? You tell us. So you tell, tell us what <laughs> town. What town? Yeah, your father wouldn't go back to <coughs> for sales. Okay. Where are you from? Springfield. Oh yeah. See, that's a that's a better town. <laughs> I mean, there's a better town. That's a better town. <laughs> Yeah, her sales is kind of, you know, this side of the Ozark, of the leg of the Ozarks. So, yeah, my great-grandfather was in, well, my grandfather, I didn't know him because he was, he died in 1929. The, the depression killed him, basically. Um, was involved in the, you know, moving graves. <coughs> they had to move all, they flooded, the leg of the Ozarks flooded all these towns. And so they, they had to move all these graves, and of course, there were horror stories of what happened when they dug up those old graves. And my grandfather would come home to the dinner, you know, to tell these stories at the dinner table and shock the children. And so my mother told us the stories. And so I kind of grew up with ghost stories, you know, hanks of hair and liquefied body. I mean, just horrible stuff. I know, I, I, I shouldn't say those things to you. It's not going to be But I don't know to get rid of those images my whole life. So, um, and it was a very political move, too, because we had um, ancestors who fought on the, the Union side during the, the Civil War. And so they were run out of one county down in Missouri. They couldn't live there anymore. And that was one of the towns they flooded out, too. So I, I'm very interested to see if they flooded it out because of their uh, politics and what goes on. But I'm writing about that right now. So the next book was um, The River Wife, and that's based on, it started with a trip I took down to New Madrid, Missouri. You know about the earthquake, the New Madrid earthquake? Yeah. Missouri people have heard of it. It's the greatest, the biggest quake that ever occurred in North America, by the way. Yeah, you might want to pay attention to that because it goes off about every 450 years, and I can guess there's going to be But it made the Mississippi River run backwards. Waterfalls appeared in the Mississippi. It rang bells. And we're talking lower Missouri, right? It rang bells in Detroit and D.C. Audubon was on a horse. You know who he is? The, the naturalist? He was on a horse in Kentucky, riding along, and the horse stopped. 
and uh, Audubon was quite a character. He began to beat the horse, of course, because that's what you do if you're not you me. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and uh, finally he just couldn't get the horse to move, and he got off, and he realized the earth was shaking. So he felt because there was a year of aftershocks, serious aftershocks, and. What makes it so important is that the town of New Madrid actually disappeared into the Mississippi River. The river took the town. It took a couple of months, but it eventually floated it out, took it down. And now, because I love this about human beings, they built a new new town of New Madrid on what's left of the bay. <laughs> and they got the museum perched right up there over the Mississippi. And they, there's a nice dock you can take and walk out there to the Mississippi, kind of look down and see if you see any town. But you don't, because I was out there. And But you also, what you have to remember is that there's aftershocks every day. And so you feel these tremors. And when I got out of my car down in New Madrid, I, I felt vertigo. Oh, gosh, because the whole thing is pretty icky. And they've got this wonderful museum there looking out over the, the old, old New Madrid. And um, they had all these books, so they, the government sent people down to check out the eyewitness reports. You know, 50 acre chunks of bank went into the Mississippi. And all the residents of New Madrid fled in, and they thought it was the apocalypse. And so there was this term that was born at that time called, and people, there were a lot of conversions, people had major religious conversions. And they were called earthquake Christians. <laughs> and they had a lot of revivals going on in that whole year because people were terrified. <clears throat> and at that same time, there was something like a solar eclipse and a big volcano went off. And so they thought, this is it. We're done. It's just bad. So, anyway, the, so this report, that, and this is what got me about this story. Um, the report what, that I read, the government report, they took all these eyewitness accounts. And one of them was from a mother. And it was confirmed that this family, that they had a cat, and you know, they had those big roof beams. One of them fell on the daughter, fell across the daughter and her dad trapping her. And it was too heavy to move, and they were too scared. So the family left it. She's alive. She was alive. And they left her. And the water's rising. And the animals are going crazy. The first major quake hit in the middle of the night. Um, there's you know, no light, and it's just horrific. And so the next day, the mother, after all the citizens had fled in, and the mother asked, finally convinced the boy, to um, a teenage boy to go back, and he did. And she was still alive. He can't move the beam. He can't budge it. And finally, he gives her some water and some food. And then he's too scared because the quakes are still going on. And the water is coming up. And they leave her. And so for the next few months, it was such a horrible story. This girl trapped there, I couldn't get it out of my head. And it became like the ghost shirt. I couldn't get rid of this idea. And so every night I'd go to sleep and I'd try to rescue her. <laughs> I'd figure out, well, you know, there were these rich fur trappers. They were really wild guys, apparently. They were dug into the banks of the Mississippi. That's how they were living. They didn't die. Well, why not? We don't know. Anyway, they were French. They're, they were very inventive. They were probably cooking beautiful food. <laughs> <laughs> a little wine, um, fabulous wine. <laughs> Possum stew, that kind of stuff. So, they, so I thought, well, maybe a French fur trapper, if after every natural disaster, there's people who come along and try to see what's left, right? Maybe they were looking for stuff. Because it took about a month or two for the, that whole town to go under. So then in my mind, oh, French fur trapper came and found her. And I thought, what would he do to her? I thought, well, it's not much of a story if he kills her, right? That's nothing. That doesn't go anywhere. But what if he rescued her? What if he got rid of Because he's, he's French and he's, got, he's a fur trapper, so he's used to making do. So he figures out how to get that, use a horse to pull that um, beam off. And he, rescues her, although her legs are, she's crippled for the rest of her life. Uh, but he falls in love with her. And so they start a life. Now, of course, he has this terrible thing that we do in this country. He wanted to make a fortune. So we know how that goes. We're living with evidence of that. 
when you try to make a fortune and you, the great fortunes in this country have been made off the backs of other people. And so that's what happens in the river. And uh, he turns to piracy. He does everything dark he can do to figure it, to get more money. And he tells himself it's for his wife. And, but after a while, it's for him. So, so that became my story. And I kept trying not to tell that story. It's interesting. I, I told my uh, agent and editor, well, I got this idea for this story. Um, it's set in Missouri. It's got, you know, and I told them about the earthquake and they were so excited. I said, but I'm not going to write any story because I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. And I have all these family members who are historians. So God knows, don't step in their shoes because they will come get you and haul you away <laughs> and humiliate you. It's okay to be an English major, but don't pretend to be an historian. <laughs> so it took me um, probably six years to, of writing drafts, maybe two or three thousand pages of drafts of novels that they hated because I kept putting that story as a backstory. Like, see, this was somebody's great aunt. See, this was... <laughs> and they just hated every version of it. And they said, no, they, we don't believe one word of this. It's like, you know, it's really, I thought I was doing this all right. <laughs> I can't write a believable word anymore. And then finally I said, okay, all right, I will write your historical novel. I am bad at it. I've never done it. I, yeah, I'm going to be bad at it. And it's just going to suck and you're going to realize I'm done. And so I wrote it. And they loved it. And they gave me a lot of money. <laughs> well, of course they did, because I didn't know how to do it. And that was just to show me what I knew really I was. Because that's what the cosmos does to you, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so that was the river life. And it's, it's been a, a book that I have enjoyed. And so now I'm writing the third in that series. And it's some of the characters of the first one, South Resurrection, and some of the characters from this novel will show up in the third. And it's about the beginning of taking place a little bit around the building of the Lake Bezos and the flooding that takes place and all the political underpinnings of that, the social underpinnings. So, um, my first novel was set in Iowa and it was called Sweet Eyes and I, I didn't know how to write a novel. Again, I tried to do things I had no idea how to do. And so that should encourage all of you, right? If you don't know how to do it, don't let that stop you, really. <laughs> but I think most writers will tell you this, that the real challenge is doing stuff you don't know how to do. And it's fun. It's more fun that way. And I was a poet. I didn't know how to write fiction. And, but I just started, and I just I found a character who wouldn't shut up, kind of like me, um, but a little different. And she lived in a small Iowa town. She'd never been to college, and she wasn't going there. And the challenge for that book was, um, it was during the, the 70s and 80s, and women were really coming into their own, and women were all supposed to want to go to college and better themselves. And my character didn't want to do that. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to kill me for this. All the critics are going to say, now why'd you write this character? Blah, 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 blah. But she has other issues. She has things she wants to think about and do, and it doesn't have to do with that. She tried a little. She went to a couple of classes. She sat in some classes at a university, and I thought it was just nonsense. So she goes on, and the first few drafts of that novel were a thousand pages. And I know you think, well, this woman just can't shut up. And it's true. Um, and they, <laughs> when we, when uh, I gave that to my agent, and he said, um, yeah, I'm just going to buy a thousand page novel from somebody they've never heard of. Uh, no. So, you, and they pointed out that somebody died in every chapter. <laughs> it was a small island town. And they said, you know, maybe that's a little much. <laughs> Quit killing things. <laughs> and let's drop about 500 pages. So, and I'm not exaggerating. So I did, and we, I rewrote it for another eight years, and finally sold it. And um, my editor then made me go through and taught me how to write it all. <laughs> so that's useful. And so that became my first novel, Sweet Eyes. And um, I'm trying to think if I left any out. Know, Strange Angels versus Sandhills novel. So people ask me um, some questions but, um, about the writing process, but I think I wish should give you a chance to ask questions. And some of this business about the writing process will come out in the process of answering. So, questions? 
Yes. We're just start writing novels on a meeting, computer, typewriter, and start writing on. Well, back then. My hand, what you? <laughs> I wrote in stone with chisel. Do <laughs> 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 you remember those days? <laughs> in the dust with a stick. No, uh, I wrote on typewriter. And um, I, I'm a fast typist, and I am the worst typist on earth. But it was really good for me because I could make mistakes, and I because it wasn't a computer, I couldn't go back very easily. And I think that taught me to write fast because I can really write fast. And but they were horrible. I finally, by the second or third novel, I had to start hiring somebody at typist to do up the final drafts because they were so terrible looking. I couldn't type a draft without so many mistakes that nobody wanted to look at it. So that was actually I think I did that for maybe maybe two months. Anyway. Um, yeah, and then I switched to computers too. I have a little laptop. You ever write long in? I do. I do. I sometimes, uh, as a form of revision, I'll write long in. If, if I've got something I'm trying to figure out and it just isn't working, it's kind of boring and even I'm falling asleep while I read it. And that does happen, but <laughs> that's a good sign you're not interesting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, yeah, then I'll write longhand and that helps. Or sometimes if I'm, I haven't been writing for a while and I need to get back, I will just sit there and in bed at night and write scenes longhand. And it just, I just imagine the characters doing anything, anything. Going to a baseball game, canning food, killing each other sometimes. Um, or near death. You know, I have to watch that food. Yeah. You probably just answered it. When is your prime time of the day to write? Um, it's always been middle of the night to early morning. I hate it. I have chronic insomnia. If I, I don't think I've slept a whole night, oh, forever, as long as I can remember. Even as a little kid, my parents used to tell me at, at two, I would get up in the middle of the night and I'd be in a really good mood. And I'd want to play. And they were exhausted, of course. They had all these children. And here's this kid wanting to play ball. You know, two in the morning. I'm kind of still like that. I will wake up, just snap away, and sometimes I'll go and write at that point. Particularly if I'm in a project, I'll just write. But if I have to go teach the next day, go to a meeting or something, it's really hard. So about how many hours a night do you average? Um, if I'm, it depends on whether I'm in a first draft or a later draft. And by the way, that's not every night. I'll, I'll get up in the morning early. I tell everyone the big thing to do as a writer is to set a time. And it's best in the morning because you're still fresh. You're, if you will, the doors of perception to your dream world are still fairly open. So don't talk to other people. Don't listen to news. Don't read anything. Keep all the electronic media off and just go and sit. Um, so usually I set, if it's a first draft, I'll set a page number that I have to hit. Because I still think in terms of pages. I know people think in terms of word count. But I, I just can't make that conversion. <laughs> so um, I'll set um, an opening game that will be about five pages. And then I'll move up to 10, and then maybe a chapter a day, maybe 20 if I'm really hitting it well. Uh, so it takes me anywhere from an hour to three hours for that. And then if I'm in a, a next draft, if I'm revising and redrafting, I'll do that again. Only I'll set it maybe a chapter a day. Or ten pages. Excuse me. And I like to get. I like to just get full through that. But it has to be in the morning. Now, when you revise, you can do that at night. I think that that took me a while. And I thought, well, don't waste your good morning time. You know, critiquing and copy editing and fixing commas. Do all that at night. So I print everything out. I go to bed a lot. <laughs> Maybe that's why I can't sleep. Oh my gosh. Big revelation. <laughs> they say don't do your electronic media at night. They should say don't critique your own work at night. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, how detailed an outline do you write? I never write from an outline. At all? Do you have an idea of what's going to happen? Um, I have a very vague idea. I, all, I most often, I've never seen the ending of a novel until I'm near the end. <laughs> I, I, then I'll see the final scene, I'll go, oh, that's where it is. And it'll really worry me, I'll go, where's this going? How long, Lord? Let me go! <laughs> I'm really tired of this, I don't, I don't know what will happen next. Let's just end it. No, keep going. <laughs> and then it'll show, show up. But, you know, it's true for 
literary novelist that a lot of us who don't work from outlines uh, because the surprise, the kind of wonder, that's why we write, to find out what these people that we've discovered or who have discovered us, all characters, what they're going to do has to be a surprise to keep it fresh. But if I have an outline, I get bored. That's kind of one of my themes today, isn't it? I will fall asleep. <laughs> it's too bored. Uh, but I know that people write genre novels, mysteries, thrillers, um, Romance, supernatural, they have to have an outline. They almost have to have one. Because the reader has certain expectations. You like to read those over and over, and I do read in genre. So, and I want certain things to happen. And they've got to happen at certain places. It's like writing screenplays. You know, to write a screenplay, certain things have to happen. You have 90 pages, up to 120. That's it. They have certain things have to happen at a certain page number, <clears throat> which I didn't know until I started writing screenplays. So, yeah, so that's the way I write. It's, I will imagine a scene, I'll think, well, this could happen. And I had a, you know, I'll kind of always be thinking, I keep a writer's notebook at all times with me. And if something occurs to me, I'll be driving, somebody will say something, I'll be in a committee meeting that's getting boring. And I'll think, oh, I can't have this happen. And so I'll write that down. And it may or may not be used, but at least I have a catalog. But in terms of the real outline, do you write from that one? I have, well, it's like a six page working outline. Okay. Because I'll start to write a scene and it won't go where I thought it would go. Yeah. So then I have to adjust because it is. I know, I know. See, I, that's why I don't do outlines because <laughs> that always happens. <laughs> This character that I thought was wonderful turns out to be not so wonderful. And then they do something and you think, oh, I hadn't prepared for that. Now what? <laughs> so I kind of like that. It's kind of like, um, you know, there's a pretty well-known writer who said, and now don't ask me who, who said it because I can't remember right now, but he said writing a novel is like driving um, with your, driving, it's like night drive. You can drive all the way across the country with your headlights on, but you can't see anything beyond your head. Right? But you know the rules there. And so I think that's a great description of writing. So just keep your headlights on. I kind of wanted him to turn them off too and see how that worked out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes? Uh, I was wondering what would be your tips for some of the, um, the initial hurdles when you start writing, like um, some kind of like writer's block or the over self critique, like self critique. Right. Or is it just being over that? I'm, I'm working with a group of young writers right now who I've discovered, I, I should have caught up with this sooner, but I realized they were writing what I call backwards. And that's something that's really started more and more with the computer. Because I've had people say, I write a sentence, and then I fix it. And then I write another sentence, and then I fix it. And to me, that's going backwards. Because you're never getting a flow. I think the biggest charge for you as a, as a young writer or somebody with writer's block is just write straight through. Don't correct anything. So I told them they had to blindfold themselves or write at night with the lights off, uh, you know, turn everything off on their computers and simply write. And then later go back and fix it because you have to be able to go forward. And uh, just look at Jack Kerouac has something called spontaneous prose, the rules of spontaneous prose. And it's about just moving yourself forward and writing, 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 until you write into what your subject is. I think most of the time we have writer's block because we think we have a subject and the writing doesn't want, as she just said, it doesn't want to obey the subject. It starts going off on its own because your unconscious mind is driving the car at that point. And it's saying, look, you want to write about that, but that's really not what I'm interested in. I'm really interested in something. I'm going to show you what I'm interested in. And so you have to allow yourself to be shown what you really are interested in. You know you can do this because you do it at night in your dreams. I bet you dream of okay. it. Yeah. And they're wild. All kinds of stuff happens. And then you sit down and write, but I can't think of anything. Oh my gosh, yeah, you can. You just got up. You, all night long you thought of stuff. And it was fabulous. So allow that process. And you're not in control, right? So allow yourself to be out of control as you sit down and just follow it. And Rick Redberg kept in front of his typewriter at all times. And you know how smart he is, right? 
where we all guarantee he was one of the smartest science people on the planet. His, in front of his typewriter was a little sign that said, don't think. Ray Bradbury, he wasn't thinking. Oh my gosh, what's happening? He's doing what I'm, I just described. Don't think. He yeah, yeah, rock and roll is the one who said, writing novels like driving your night fall. He yeah, rock and roll. Yeah, good, good, thank you, yes. Okay, you were already talking about it, so I'm like, oh my god. But anyway, uh, this whole thing about composing while you're asleep. Yep. And so, do you find that happens a lot? And then you have to wake up and write, write the end because you're thinking in your dream, kind of halfway. Hey, that's pretty good. Yeah, I, I rarely do that. I've had some moments where I thought I wrote the world's best poem, for instance. <laughs> And I'll wake up and it's gone. <laughs> but I think that's our unconscious mind tricking us too. But I also will give myself assignments before I go to sleep. And this really does work. I'll say, particularly if I'm in a, a sticky spot in a, in a novel, I go, I don't know what's happening. What could happen? I've already taken them to the, the quick stop. They've held up a gas station. They've done a lot of stuff. They've, they've killed some people. But no. So what I do is I just I make an assignment to myself. Figure I just need to know what to do next. And I don't dream it directly, but when I wake up in the morning and I go to write, I start writing. So obviously something is working. But yeah, if you can solve those things in your sleep, that'd be great. If it gave you a direct message, yeah. Okay, so follow up to your question about writing backwards. I have the opposite problem where I can write great forwards, but then the revision process is horrible. Do you have any tips for the revision process? Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, because I always hated revision. I just hate it. Yeah, see, that's it. We hate the revision. Yeah, we, we like that original stuff. Don't yeah. We? yeah, and we can't see how to fix it because it seems so perfect. Although other people say it's not so perfect. <laughs> I think what really helped me was people, and I, it, I really came to understand revision finally when I started writing novels. With stories, not so much. Uh, because to me, they were, they were a little closer to poems. They were language charged in that way. But with novels, I began to understand, oh yeah, if they can't follow the plot, or if they hate the characters, I gotta fix it. Because I have that pressure on me. You know, I do, wanna, I do want readers for those novels and stories. So if somebody's, are you having your work read by somebody? Uh, only friends and family. Like okay, the worst people, people to read your work. Right. I'm sorry, I, for all friends and family, <laughs> you're good people. I'm sure you have decent hearts, mostly. <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, don't go there. Because they'll tell you what you want to hear. Or they'll be so mean, it takes your breath away. And the other thing is, they weren't trained. I, I ask my students all the time, do your... Have, do your parents read or friends read literary journals that have current literary writing in it? Well, no. Well, then how would they know what they're looking at? So find someone who's also a writer or a really good editor who's who's got a good balance view. You. you don't want you don't want a talent slayer, somebody who's just gonna tell you that you suck and you know give it up. I had somebody, I had more than one somebody tell me that years ago when I was a young writer, and you just have to ignore that. They're coming out of some mean place where they were told to stop too. But find, are there other writers where you are in your world? Only Steph. <laughs> are you good? All right, so do you show it to her? We just became friends, so oh, we good. haven't gotten to that level of intimacy yet. Okay, so share <laughs> writing. Her. But, but the agreement is that you, you don't need a cheerleader. Right. You want to know where the pieces, what parts of it are good, where they work, but you also want to know where it doesn't work, where you don't believe it. And that's a trust thing. I worked with the same writer for 25 years. He and I shared work. We were not in a relationship or married or anything. We married other people. But we really knew each other. We, we trusted each other as writers. And that was really important. I would never have published a piece of writing that he hadn't read, and vice versa. Now, I'm, right now, I'm married to a writer. And so he and I share the work. And he's so mean. <laughs> I was just I really do. One night when we were first married, you know, he was looking at my novel and at some scene and he, he started just yelling at me. We were in bed, of course, because that's where you always want to do your good critical work, right? You want to get your response out there. So, and he starts yelling at me about, I should know better than to write like this. I'm, I've, I've been at it too long. This is just terrible. 
And I, I started crying, and I don't cry very easily. And, but just a little bit, but he doesn't respond to that. So that was useless. <laughs> but finally I said, you know what? You stop. This is way, don't, stop being so mean. I don't mean that. And he finally calmed down and he later apologized. But I thought, yeah, oh, okay. But he had to learn how to respond to me. And he got, he got a little kinder while he was being very harsh. Like, oh, your character's a big It's like, oh, shit. And that was in this novel. So, but it was good. I needed to know that it's because I had to really soften her. And then the agent said the same thing. It's like, oh, yeah, it really is bad, isn't it? So you do need to listen to that and not be defensive. And that just takes time. You have to trust that you're a good enough writer that you can get. It. You can do this. Treat that as okay. If your character isn't sympathetic, yeah, you hate the person who said that for about ten minutes, maybe a couple of days or a year. But the thing is. <laughs> have to listen to it and say, okay, all right, I'm going to have to fix this because I do want readership. Think about your goal. If you want readers, you've got to fix this. And that teaches you how to revise and how to be ingenious about it. So the big thing is to dismantle that, that defensiveness. Because mm -hmm. none of us, I mean, that's, that's why your family is wrong because they'll, they'll tell you nice things and that doesn't help you. You could hire a cheerleading squad, that might be useful. <laughs> Somebody else. Yes. Once, some, once something is published, have you ever gone back and said, oh, I wish I had done that different? Oh, yes. Have you ever noticed writers are up there when they're doing readings and they're, poets are really notorious for this. They sit up there with a pen and they're fixing the poems. Practically, as they're reading them out loud, couldn't you have done this earlier? Didn't it occur to them? There's not that many words for gosh sakes. Right away. <laughs> but um, I know I've looked at other writers' um, novels and stories, and there'll be all these marked out sections. And if you look at my previous uh, printed books, you'll see marked out sections. You go, why did I write that? Why didn't they catch this? This is terrible. <laughs> and so, because as you read it out loud and get ready for a performance of it, you hear the weakness of it. And I do think it's really a good idea, by the way, to read your work out loud before you send it. And one of the ways you can you can hear it, and this helps with revision, is have somebody read it to you. And boy, do you hear it. So, oh. You gotta get over the cringes and but but also get over the congratulations. Because you're always going, oh, it's really good there, yeah, yeah. And then you didn't know this horrible line would show up and go, oh no, that could be my writing. <laughs> I would never write something that stupid. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, when I first started going out there in about 1990, 1991, um, I went out, I lived in Minnesota, I was living in St. Paul, Minnesota, teaching up there, and it was about an eight hour at least drive to uh, Valentine and, you know, all the hills. And I would do that every other week, every weekend sometimes, months on end. And I would spend as long as I could driving all over the sand hills. I went into Wyoming, the Dakotas, the reservations just to see how that worked. And then I realized, because of, I, one thing I always do about any place I'm writing about, I have to learn the history of it. So I bought histories of Missouri and, and uh, the Sand Hills, Nebraska. And then I have to know about the plants, particularly because I'm interested in, in the agricultural life of most of these places. So, I, and I realized the grasslands. I didn't know anything about grasslands. So I, I got field books, and I began to stop by the road and try to field identify flowers. And I had one purple flower I could not get anyone. I, I asked every rancher, every person in, that I encountered, what the name of this thing was. Nothing. So then sometimes they just they just said, "Oh, it's called the purple flower." <laughs> so okay, so much for all the. <laughs> uh, but I, I immersed myself in in as much as I could find out about Native American culture out there. The Lakota people, their history. Um, I got to know some Lakota people. Um, I just, I just tried to live as if and find out everything I could. So I have a lot of notebooks and a lot of books. 
And I take photographs too as I travel. I did that in Missouri too. Um, because sometimes you'll see, and this is good, sometimes you'll see something and you'll think, oh, that, that could go in my novel. And if you're relying only on your memory, <laughs> It's like anybody's memory, you forget important things. You can write about it at that point, but a photograph really does help. So, particularly for plays. <clears throat> so, that's kind of what I did. So, and then my sister and I bought some land out and just south of Valentine on the Niagara River. And we, had, yeah, that was only a couple hundred. Listen to this. It was only a couple hundred acres, which is like your backyard <laughs> to say <laughs> that to Because those places are so big, because it takes. 50 acres per cow calf pair to support cattle on that land because it's so fragile. So we could support four cows with their calves. And I thought, well, yeah, we're going to work that. So this, this is an epic. And so we ended up selling it, which was sad. It was beautiful. Yes. I think some people have an impression that novels have to live in New York City. They go to lunch regularly with their agent, those kinds of things. Is that just a myth? I think it's a myth. There's, there's novelists, even, particularly now. There's, there's writers all over this country. We're living in a real renaissance of writing. We haven't seen this many writers since the renaissance, where it's really considered a great thing. And people feel really, you know, everybody feels, oh, I can write a novel, I can write a poem. And I, I'm so excited by this. All The whole uh, burst of writing programs around the country and, and just, it's a very exciting time to be a writer. And there are now agents living outside of New York. That's my next question. Yeah. yeah. What's the propensity for an agent to not live in New York City? It's harder for them, yeah. but there are some doing it. And they still have to have connections in New York because it depends. So there's a lot of publishing going on outside of New York, too. Sure. You know, the big houses have basically bought each other. So there's four main businesses with a lot of different imprints now. and. But there's a lot of growing, younger publishing concerns. The, um, the small press movement has become the large literary press movement, and they're getting the major prizes too, so that's really good. And my husband and I have started a small literary press, I'm saying this because we always felt like there was so much great writing um, that we just, we were so excited. We, we thought, well, now some of these people, because New York isn't going to publish every book, and so we wanted to publish books that we thought deserved to be published. So we run a book prize every year, a prize in poetry, a prize in a short story, and a prize in a novel, $1,000 prize in publication for each of those. And we publish a couple of other books that we found that we like. And for the same reason, those, these small presses are growing up again too, and that's something we saw in the 70s and 80s, and then they died out, and now they're back. And so it's a good time to be a writer, so everybody should write. Write like crazy, go crazy, and do it. Yeah. Can you tell us about your educational background? Yeah, um, I have a BA from the University of Iowa. I started school in a small uh, women's college in, um, outside St. Louis, and then transferred to Iowa because I knew writers were there. And I'd always said I was going to be a writer, even though I hadn't written anything. So <laughs> now that was a <laughs> we're hoping that was kind of a pressing thing, but or just, you know, outlandish ambition, who knows. And so, then I knew the Iowa Writers Workshop was there. So I transferred there, and of course, I didn't realize you had to be a graduate student to be in the Iowa Writers Workshop. But I did, I did take workshops with some fairly famous writers, and so that was good. And then I got an MA and PhD from uh, what was in the State University of New York in Binghamton. It's now, they've changed their names, which kind of makes you feel disenfranchised. Because now it's Binghamton University. It's, it's not the same. You know, what's that? Anyway, um, I did that because I wanted, I knew, I started as a poet. I knew no sane person could believe they could support themselves with poetry. There are some insane people who are doing a job of it, but I, could, I didn't have that much energy. I knew I couldn't go out and hustle like that. Uh, but I wanted to have a way to support myself, and then I had a daughter, and I needed to have a stable life for both of us. So I thought, okay, I can teach, and I can write, and I knew I could do both of those. I hoped I could write. And then it turned out I was writing fiction, but I'm not fast enough to make a living in fiction either. Like, this novel took eight years. Well, 
it's just not, you're not going to earn a living. <laughs> so I probably looked out about 50 cents an hour, maybe a quarter an hour for that. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so that's what I did, and that's what I've been doing. And fortunately, the world came along with me, and all, all these writing programs opened up. And so it was really the universities and colleges began to welcome writers onto their campuses and not just see us as terrible nuisances. She has a question, but I have a question. Okay. And we'll close on that one. All right, go for it. Um, is there a specific process you go through when creating and developing a new character? Um, usually, my, and I'm going to do this little workshop this afternoon, so stop in because I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, <laughs> but I usually, characters come to me. I feel like if we're open, and it's what I was telling that young man back there, just open the doors. And all those people from your dreams, you know, there's a lot of voices in there that want to be heard. A lot of people. And if your dreams are full of people, they are the people, you know, they'll show up for you. And so I, I'll i see somebody, as soon as I see somebody doing something. Or Flannery O'Connor said, as soon as she heard somebody speak, she knew something about them. She, she could write that. And I'm kind of the same way. You know, they'll, they'll just start talking and they'll do something. And then their name comes to me. And I know it sounds magical and weird, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, um, it probably is. <laughs> but it isn't. It isn't. It's just everybody has a different thing they do, but I don't necessarily calculate it. But I try to grow into knowing them. I have to know. And in this book, one of my challenges was there's a couple of very dark characters in there. And I, I found them hard to write hard to reread, and I knew I hadn't gotten to them. I didn't know who they were. And so what I make myself do with almost every character is write some something, even if it doesn't show up in the book, I'll write from their perspective to try to figure out how they see the world. So there's a character called Percival Chance in here. He's quite a uh, naughty man, and naughty is said kindly. But I thought, well, what's driving this guy? Why has he, he got all this going on? And then I, I wrote something from his perspective. I found out about his childhood, about his life, and I understood it, which made him a real character. And I could then convey him without being sympathetic. And that's the key. You don't have, if, you, if you understand their problems, you don't have to like them. You just have to understand, oh, that's their thing. And that's their slant. And that's how they do it. Yes? Just curious, when you were at uh, Iowa, was uh, David Morrell here at the same time, Randall? I know you're talking about, it's funny because I was at a conference with him 100 years later. Uh, um, no, he wasn't. I don't think he was. I was there in the uh, mid 60s. Yeah, yeah, there were, and I mostly paid attention to the poets. Yeah, but I noticed that the hardworking people were the fiction writers. The poets were always out of the bars drinking and partying. They didn't go to parties and fight. Because poets always have issues. They, they have positions. And the fiction writers are just exhausted. So they would come and go, oh, I'm just drinking beer now. I don't want to talk. I'm not like that anybody. The poets would be, sometimes literally, I, I came upon a poet I knew. Um, he was in front of a store at about 1 a.m. in the morning on the, the public street, wrestling on the ground with some guy, having this big fight. You're a poet, stop. Be it or something. But, yeah, no. <laughs> if I had known, <laughs> well, Kurt Kotteck was there then. Vance Bergeli, um, R.B. Castle, and the poets that were there that I had were Donald Justice and Mark Strand, who were big, and Marvin Bell, they were all there then. Um, so, 